starting from, from the beginning, uh, we're now going to be looking at not just calling single nucleotide variants and small indels, but looking for larger structural variants. So the objective of this module is really, well, understand what, what I mean by structural variants, um, how can you discover structural variants from next generation sequencing data. There's lots of different ways, and a little bit like I started saying with the indel, it's harder to detect structural variants than single nucleotide variants, and, and I'll explain a little bit the strengths <coughs> and the weaknesses of the different methods. Uh, What's, what patterns do you expect? I guess you guys started already in the IGV session yesterday looking at deletions and, and patterns that you expect. But we'll go over that in more detail now and, and detect them using the program Delhi that's running and then looking at some of them uh, in more detail. So uh, so what are the structural, what, what's, what, what do we mean by structural uh, variants? So there's, there's lots of, of definitions, but it's roughly something that affects something that's bigger than 50 base pairs. So you can think of single change, single base pair change, small indels, structural variants, we typically mean something that's just a little bit bigger. So slightly bigger chunks of the genome that are changed. It can be a deletion, it can be an insertion, it can be an inversion. Uh, you've got mobile element transposition. Uh, duplications of whole sections, translocations, so anything, all of these bigger change, uh, this is what we mean by structural variants. Uh, it's been known for, for many years that, that these types of structural uh, variants also occur. Uh, you know, so as soon as, as you had technologies that could look at chromosomes, for instance, uh, we could detect things like translocation, using this fish technology, but uh, all of these are, are sort of high level, you know, high, uh, low resolution uh, methods. Now that we have all of this detailed sequencing data, we should be able to extract from, uh, from the, all of these reads, you know, very, very high resolution information about these changes and exactly where on the chromosome is that translocation. So there's all of these larger changes that are happening to the genome. And so really the objective of this module is how can we extract that from, from the read information. Uh, this is in particularly relevant in cancer. So this is an example of, of a normal uh, tumor. So the, the chromosome painting here, every cro in the normal genome, every chromosome would be painted in just one color. The fact that they're all jumbled up is because there's all of these larger rearrangements, larger translocation, chromosome duplications, and so on. So how can we, if we sequence and we, all we have are bits and pieces of the genome, how can we actually extract back this information? Um, so the different classes of structural variants, so you've got copy number, so this is the deletions and the duplications, so you're changing the, cop, the, you know, the, the number of copies uh, of, of a particular section of the genome. You have these other uh, rearrangements that are copy neutral, so inversions don't change the content but are changing the order. Same with translocation. And then what you can call other structural variants with novel insertions of sequences, uh, uh, transposon that are jumping around and so on. Um, here now is, is sort of a more uh, visual representation of these. Um, I use this. Um, so, so here you have so a deletion. So the reference genome lost that copy. So this is just showing this here. A new insertion relative to the reference. There's a piece in the genome that you've sequenced. Oops. You, there's a piece. There's a new piece. Uh, a mobile element insertion. Similar. This is an insertion, but just of a. And the trick here is if you're talking about alus and things like that, you have an insertion, but that particular piece of DNA is also found in lots of other regions of the genome, so this can be challenging to detect. Tandem duplication, you have the same region that just gets um, uh, copied next to each other, to, to it. Interspersed, so this is a, also a duplication, but the two segments are not next to each other. Inversion, as I mentioned, so you've got a, a whole uh, section of the genome that gets flipped, translocation, um, two chromosomes exchanging, and so on. 
So, <clears throat> so a lot of, of, of our ability to detect uh, these structural variants sort of follows the, the technology. So it started with karyotyping, just looking at very gross abnormalities of chromosome, uh, CGH and FISH, and some of these technologies that, that I was talking about, uh, that we were looking at, uh, gave sort of slightly more precise, but you still didn't really know which genes were affected, you know, in detail or anything like that. And we were missing out small, uh, small events, um, you know, in the, in the early 2000s. So microarrays were used, especially array CGH, to have much more precise profiling of, of especially copy number change. Uh, and now, you know, with the sequencing, you would think that we can detect everything. But as you'll see, the challenge is, is really on the informatics analysis of these data. Um, so, um, so, you, so array CGH uh, is, is, you know, or, you know, and SNP arrays both can be used to detect copy number. Array CGH, you really have probes throughout the genome. And then based on the le level of intensity, you have an expected level of intensity. And so if you have higher intensity of the probe, uh, you're able to detect that there's a, a gain, lower, you know, one copy, zero copy. So, and then you, because you have tiling of probes throughout the genome, you're able to, to detect these copy neutral, uh, these copy, not neutral, copy number change. One challenge or limitation here is that you won't be able to detect an inversion or a translocation using this, this type of approach. Uh, you can use the very popular SNP arrays as well. Uh, so this, these were used for genotyping initially. So SNP is you, you really have representative of, of all of the SNP in the genome. Uh, these were designed after a you know, project like HapMap project to look uh, you know, which variants are present in different but you can also use that because you can look at the level of intensity as well in these arrays to, at some level to detect copy number. So, I mean, it, it is possible to detect copy number variants uh, using arrays, but with, with next generation sequencing, in theory, we can detect those copy number change, but also other types of events much more precisely in theory. Uh, so whether, you know, what we were looking at in the first module is more, you know, these types of the point mutations. So you should be familiar. This is very much like IGV. You've got these parent end sequencing. We were looking for these types of changes. Uh, in some cases, we could detect the small in deletion indels as well. But now, what we're trying, to, what we're going to do in this lab is move into this other spectrum of, you know, if there's no reads in a particular region in the genome, it's likely a deletion. If you have more reads than you expect, you should be able to call it a gain. Uh, we should be looking for, be able to look for these types of weird pairs that maybe point to a translocation breakpoint and so on. So, you know, all the information is in the reads and the question is, can we extract the information from the reads? Uh, so, but, you know, one challenge is that, you know, here, if you remember the step is that we would map all the reads these were all mapped correctly to this location, and then we look for change. The problem with these guys is that, you know, you get things like this, where the reads are not really mapping the way you should be, and, and all sorts of other things. So we're going to be using other properties of, of the reads. Um, so the strategies to, to call, um, to call uh, structural variants from reads is that we, we're going to re use the, the, the read information in a different way. So we can use the read pair information. So I'll, I'll get into each of them separately. But we can use the way the two ends of the reads are mapping as a way of detecting uh, uh, structural variants. We can use the read depth. But this is what I was doing sort of by eye uh, to look for places where there's more reads or fewer reads. We can use the fact that Sometimes the reads are going to be split over the breakpoint. So this is like, again, looking at the read itself and how it's mapping and then seeing patterns where it's like it's getting cut. Uh, or you can do de novo assembly. And this is like in the session you did uh, with Jared last night uh, where you're, you're starting from scratch. All of the other ones are using the reference as a... So we'll go over 
sort of quickly, but just to give you a sense of how, how these methods work. So using the read pair information first. So, so here, um, every time, well, most, so especially if you're interested in structural variance, typically you'll do paired and uh, reads. So you have a fragment, and, and you're reading at the beginning and at the end of the fragment. And typically when you prepare your sample, uh, you prepare it such that the fragment, and this is especially important if you're doing structural variance, you want to have a relatively tight distribution of fragment size. Because then, if you have, so this is, an unusual, this is a library where the target was to have fragments of 10 KB, and then we read the beginning and the end. So most fragments that you read um, tend to then have this distribution. They're all around 10 KB. But you have reads where the beginning and the end uh, are, are way too far once you map them, or way too short. And we're going to be using that information to identify regions that have had rearrangements, basically. Uh, but the key here is that your, your actual DNA fragments were all 10 KB. So as soon as you map them, and they're not 10 KB, they're not concordant, you can use that information to say something is going on in the genome at that position. Uh, so you can use that information. So this is what you expect on the left. Um, so you have the reference genome, you have the C genome that you're sequencing. You, there's an expectation of how far they are. Uh, if when you map um, on the reference genome they're too far, this means that there's probably a piece that's missing. So that's, you can associate that to be the deletion because you know, when you map on the genome, it's 20 KB apart. But almost none of your fragments were 20 KB based on the way you prepare the fragments. So if you see a, a fragment that looks like it's 20 KB, it's probably because you have a 10 KB deletion. Uh, you have the reverse. If once you map them on the genome, they're very close, uh, maybe it's because there's an insertion in the genome that you've sequenced. So the read pair strategies uh, are using information about how the pairs map to detect these change. Uh, similarly, so this was just using the distance. You can also use the orientation in some case. There's a very there's a specific expected pattern of how when you read the fragment, uh, you expect a specific orientation. Uh, so this is the orientation that you expect of the read. If you map on the reference and you see a pattern like this, where so one end is here, and then the other end, the other end is not here, it's, it's over there. So again, you can, you can go back and figure out what was the underlying genome and configuration. So, this, so a pattern like this, when you map on the reference genome, it's probably an indication that there's a tandem duplication. Uh, an insertion is going to have its own little pattern. Uh, an insert, an inversion. Sorry, an inversion is is uh, interesting in the sense that it's going to have. You, you should, if it's a good inversion, or if you have it, if you'll have the two breakpoints will give you complementary evidence of something that's weird. Right? So this guy, this guy maps here and here. That makes no sense. You expected them to be like this. And same with this, so you can really, it's like a mini puzzle. You can turn it back and figure out what was going on. Uh, <clears throat> that said, and this is now uh, an insertion from maybe uh, a, a different region, for instance, or, or a repetitive element. So all of them will have very distinctive patterns in terms of how the pairing works. Uh, the trick is how do you actually implement an algorithm that looks for these patterns and, and, and predict the structural variance. So there's a number of tools uh, that do that. So Breakdancer, uh, Delhi, Lumpy. So the one that we're going to be using um, is, is Delhi in this case. Uh, but all of them try to do the same thing. They look for this evidence of mismapping pairs, look for multiple instances. Because just like with the single nucleotide, if you just see one weird read, you don't care. But if you see multiple reads that are saying the same thing, uh, that's probably a good, uh, good sign. So, um, well, this, this is maybe not super interesting or relevant, but 
Well, one thing that's, that's so this is one of the this is one of the early on uh, whole genome sequencing study that I know it's what I participated in, and here we were doing this sort of semi manually before these algorithms were out there, and we were trying to interpret based on the read pairs and all of that, detecting deletions, duplications, and so on. Um, one of the things that and and again at that time we didn't have whole genome sequencing. This is Five, six years ago, it was still expensive to do whole genome sequencing in, the, in the whole, you know, completely. So, but we had this paired end strategy and so on detecting. But one thing that's interesting in this table is that we had two normal samples, and then we had all of these cancer samples. And if you look, one thing that should jump out as a bit weird is that the normal, oops, the normal sample look almost as bad as the cancer sample. Um, and the reason for that is uh, because there's a lot of germline structural variants as well. So when you're sequencing uh, a tumor, uh, you also need to sequence a normal sample to know, you know, which change or somatic change versus germline change. But it's not, uh, that's not, that's not so bad, that's so interesting. I wanted to show you this just to show the complexity, though, of, of, of these types of data sets. So this is... Uh, well, it's hard to see with this light, but <coughs> what this is showing is, so on top you have array CGH. So this is just uh, giving you an indication of copy number. As you sequence through the genome, there's different chromosomes, chromosome 1, 3, 17, that clearly have these very big amplification um, of certain regions because they have multiple, multiple copies. So the thing we get with, with whole genome sequencing it's the same thing in a way. So we get, uh, you know, the de here the coverage just shows you that there's clearly some regions of the genome that have multiple copies, right? So you can definitely see that. But what you have on, on top of that is all of this paired end information that gives you, a, gives you some idea of what's connected to what. So what the, what the graph down here shows is for instance, so here clearly there's an amplification of this section, and clearly there's an amplification here. But this says that we had a thousand pairs that linked this DNA to that DNA. So we know that we, we know more than just there's lots and lots of copies. We know that this bit seems to now in this rearranged genome be next to this bit as a, as a you know, tandem duplication of that little section. And we can actually go back. So this means that, well, we call it maybe an early event, but it's just we know the specific breakpoints, and you, we know what is next to what. So we know maybe that there's a fusion gene or that there's a new promoter to that gene and so on. So it's, it's useful information, but it's also sort of a bit messy and hard to interpret exactly how it's arranged and, and what happened. Anyway, so in terms of a summary of, of these types of approaches, uh, well, I didn't discuss any of these things before. So it's challenging when you've got repetitive regions because those will lead to weird pairs because you just don't know where to put them. So it's harder to interpret structural variants when the regions are not unique because then you have mapping issues on top of that. When it's highly rearranged, it's hard to untangle and really know what's going on. So all of the approaches in the tool that I, I talked about tend to have high rates of false positives because, uh, again, repetitive regions might lead to false positives. Highly rearranged regions are difficult. Um, but in theory, from these approaches, you can detect almost anything. So it's still uh, a, a valuable strategy, but, but it's going to have a lot of false positives too. Uh, another strategy that's sort of complementary strategy is to use the read depth information um, so this we've sort of manually done a little bit in, in IGV. So if you look at the coverage, just looking at the coverage, it's kind of easy just to, it jumps out that there's more read in this region than, than in the rest of the genome. So it's likely that you have a duplication. So this also, I mean, so this looks visually very easy. In practice, it's also a little bit challenging because um, other things affect the read density in different regions of the genome. Um, so you've got, uh, so it's, it's also, there's, there's a number of tools that use these approaches, but it can be also 
a bit challenging. Uh, many of the approaches similar to the, you know, that would work on the RACI GH and so on also work on, on read depth. You just need to adapt them a little bit to, to take into account uh, the variability in, in the sequencing. So typically you tend to try to bin and then, and then uh, count. But I mean, this is a complementary approach uh, that works relatively well. Um, this is, is another plug for some of the things that, uh, that, that we do, and maybe I skip this slide, but the approach that, that, that uh, a student in my group has developed is that one challenge is that the coverage tends to vary across the genome quite a bit. So these, this shows multiple samples, multiple normal samples, and shows that the coverage across the genome tends to vary quite a bit. Uh, and we use that as sort of as a reference. And then when we're interested in one sample, we look at the amount of coverage in that specific sample, and it becomes very easy to see that it's, a, it's an outlier, potentially. But again, these, this is just one of the approach. Uh, there's lots and lots of them uh, where you can apply looking at the read depth to try to detect a uh, copy number. Uh, and again, it's, it's not a trivial problem. And, and especially in regions, again, that are repetitive and so on, there's still a relatively high rate of, of false positive. Uh, so as a summary, so we won't be using any of these uh, tools in the practical, but of course you can, you can try and you can visualize the calls in the uh, in IGV uh, as we've done for the small change. So, um, so, so, um, copy number, uh, so read depth approaches, I'm putting relatively low resolution because, you know, you have to have bins of a certain size. You, know, you don't get exactly the breakpoint because you're just binning the data and finding places where it's going up and down. And, and just like the array-based approach with read depth, you cannot see an inversion or the balance rearrangements. Um, strengths, so you're, from this you're actually estimating the number of copies of that part of the genome. And that, in some case, might be useful. If, if it's a gene that's duplicated, is there two copies, four copies, five copies, and so on? Um, so if you don't have a lot of coverage, if you make bins big enough, you might still see this whole chromosome is gone because I don't have any reads on it. So you can sort of adjust the resolution. So, so that was uh, this, this type of approach. Uh, the other type of approach that I won't go into much detail uh, is the split read approaches. And this is uh, a bit similar to the read uh, pairs, but here you're really looking at, at one of the reads basically overlapping the breakpoint and, and, and you know, uh, giving an indication that there's something funny because half of the read maps here and then the other half, not, you know, before I was saying this, this end of the read maps here and the other end the maps over there. This is really the read itself that just partially maps at this location and then, and then it breaks out. And so you've got approaches that specifically target the split reads. And actually, um, Delhi that we're going to use uses, combines the read pair and the split read to really identify these structural variants. So it, it uses reads that map a little bit and then the other the part of the read doesn't map. But uh, again, this is very similar to the, but you can imagine again that you have to look into how the reads map in the file. And these are all reads that map in a weird way in the file, right? So you have to scan the files um, to look for that, these pieces of evidence. Um, so you need to have sufficient coverage for these methods to work because you need the read to actually overlap the breakpoint same problems in repetitive regions. Uh, you can combine them with read pair methods, and so that's really what, uh, what Delhi does. Uh, but this, this one is really great because you have the specific base, you know, so you have a read that maps to the genome and suddenly, you know, it doesn't map anymore, it maps somewhere else. So you really have base pair resolution through that. Um, the last section which I, I won't uh, discuss much, but this is just you, you, you assemble all of your reads and then you compare to the reference after that. Um, so this is 
completely like using approaches like Jared talked about last night. You assemble your genome, your tumor from all of the reads, and then you compare directly the context that you've generated with the reference uh, and, and, see for, and see if there are differences. So the de novo assembly tools, but except that, as Jared said yesterday, assembling something like the human genome is still quite challenging with the short reads. So that's one of the challenges with trying to predict uh, SV. But you can definitely try, you know, you assemble from scratch, uh, and then you look at differences between the genome you've assembled and not. Uh, weakness is it's computationally quite intensive. It's hard to resolve the repetitive and the complex regions. Uh, but in theory, that's the ultimate way. If we had longer reads and a good way of assembling the genome, this would solve the problem. We would just assemble the genome that we've sequenced and compared um, and compared the two. So in summary, and I'm coming to the end of, of, this, uh, of this intro, and we'll move back to the practical. Uh, <clears throat> so you've got the whole range of approaches that, you know, starting from approaches that use depth of coverage that have low resolution but are quite easy. You're just binning and you're looking. Uh, you have approaches that are paired in that, you know, it starts to have a better resolution. Um, you have the split read that really point, but now you really have to sequence quite a bit to get enough split read to detect events to the full de novo assembly. Uh, but those are, uh, in theory, high resolution, but very difficult. Uh, it's more difficult than, than costly in this case. It's just it's difficult because assembling any genome is difficult. So you don't know the difference between problem in the assembly and, and yeah. So um, do you know any programs that can sort of give you a list? Of, like, so if you're using a de novo assembly approach, do you know of any programs that can kind of give you a list of the differences and insertions and deletions? And That's a good question. I guess any programs that can pull out differences in assembly would be good, right? So there's lots of programs for de novo assembly that actually help you assess and compare different assembly to know which one is better and sort of zoom in. Uh, personally, I have not used de novo assembly to call structural variants in human because it's, it's quite, but it's really, I mean, at the end, you're getting context out of your assembly, right? And then you can blot those on the reference and see which ones map perfectly and which ones don't, right? And then pull out. So, uh, but any other tool that would actually help you sort of compare assembly just in general for de novo assembly would also in a way, but I'm not so familiar with things that specifically extract structural variants from, from that. I, they, they must be, but I haven't used any of them. Yeah, it's because for fungal organisms, you can just do the novo assembly every time. Right. It's not very big. Yeah. And it's not that costly to do that. Yeah. And you're saying that it's a higher, um, you're getting a higher resolution. Yeah, absolutely. Cost, so. Because, I mean, one problem is, so if you, like, for instance, if you have a, a section, you know, if you have an insertion of something that's not in your genome, right, in your reference genome, then... If, if you're only doing things that are reference-based, that information gets lost. Those reads don't get mapped, and so they don't really show up. So it's, it's just that, like, again, I mean, maybe this is a bit too human-centric the way I'm presenting it. There's not much of that in human. Most of the structural variants are of the other types, and so we're not missing much by not doing that. Uh, and we can do that sort of independently. Do you have reads that don't map and things like that? But for sure, if you can do a de novo assembly, it's actually quite good to detect the structural variants, and then you're comparing these separately. Um, yes? Well, the inversions, I think the, in theory the inversions are not so bad because the only problem, so the reads map properly, it's just that they don't have the right orientation, right? Uh, so usually those map okay, and it's just that you need to have a program like Daily to just scan these map reads and, and pull out and extract them. So those, in theory, are not so bad. In practice, I think, well, in Newman, they're not so common. There's not so many inversions, so there's not so many um, 
there's many fewer than deletions and duplication for sure. So they're less common, but, but in theory, you can extract them from that. And they have this advantage of, again, having a good inversion <laughs> would have two breakpoints. And so you should have evidence on both sides. And so you can really have confidence that it's real. Because if you've got, I mean, in my slides, I have an example of it. If you really see that pattern, it's pretty clear that it's real. Because, OK? Um, yeah, so just before I finish with a few examples of what this looked like, uh, again, this is inhuman, but typically what people do is actually apply many methods and, and combine the results of all of them because they all have false positive and they all have false negatives. So typically people try many methods and, and validate. So if you look at 1000 Genome Project or, or this is a recent... Uh, uh, sequencing projects in the Netherlands. For structural variants, they really apply, you know, there's different tools that are good for different types of events. So they apply all sorts of tools. They look at the variants that are called in many tools. And then either they focus <laughs> on things that are called by all, but then they're probably missing a lot. Or they, they go in and they validate. But it's, it's quite hard and tricky to, to detect uh, the structural variants in, in just in general compared to the, the, the individual. But, okay, but what, in terms of what you hope to see, so what you hope to see are, are things like this. Again, we've seen some examples, um, some examples when we were looking at IGV. This is the type of profile we hope to see for deletion. This would be a homozygous deletion because you have no reads at all in this intron. And then all the reads flanking are, are colored here because they don't have the expected uh, insert size. Right, so they're all too far apart uh, in the genome. Uh, so this was next to this, probably, and so on. So we'll see examples like this. But these are this is a signature of a deletion, a homozygous deletion. Um, this would be a signature of a of a duplication. So notice that you have more reads in this region compared to the flanks. And again, at the at the boundary of this duplication, you have all pairs of reads that have the wrong orientation in this case, uh, with this probably being next to that. And you're like, on the reference, it makes no sense. That's because in the genome you've sequenced, these are next to each other, but it makes no sense. Here's an example of an inversion like I was talking about. So an inversion would lead to this type of pattern where you have, you know, well, roughly an even coverage. This is not a copy number game. But well, you have lots of pairs, which you have one end here and the other end that's here, and, and the reverse with, with pairs where, you know, connect from here to here. So this is a pattern where you know, you've got a breakpoint here and, and in here somewhere, and, and the whole segment is flipped such that this is indeed next to that, and this is indeed next to this. And so this is just, so this looks like a real inversion. Um, here's uh, something that would be an insertion, uh, a line insertion. <clears throat> so line insertion um, here where, um, you know, within the repeats mapping is difficult, but then uh, all of these, um, these reads uh, map. So here they don't have the expected uh, insert length. So this would be easy. Uh, an insertion in the reference in this case. But um, so, so we'll go through the, the exercise. We won't be, we're going to focus on the deletion in the practical, uh, but, but you'll see examples like this. Another cool thing with, with SVs is that it gives you an opportunity to make nice plots, but uh, they look nicer than, than uh, SNV. So these plots just show uh, sort of all chromosomes from one down to here, and these are all sort of insertions or translocations. These are big events, so you can represent them in a different way, too. Uh, but I think with that, uh, well, I'll take more questions if you have, but we'll go back and actually go through the, the practical and run Delhi and try to find some examples. What kind of frequency of different type of Different types of events? Yeah. Well, so the most common are really the deletions and the duplication. So, um, there's even between individual, right? There's more of the genome 
that's different because of these structural variants than SNPs, right? So we have so how, how often do you see like structure, big structure? Quite a lot, right? So there's there's um, what we're gonna see. We're gonna be in just one portion of the genome, and there's lots of deletion. Uh, you know, most of the genome we don't really know what it does, and we have tons of deletion, right? So it's one of the reasons why I don't want to sequence my own genome. I don't want to see where I have deletion. <laughs> and you don't have that gene. It's like, what does that mean? It's like, I don't want to know, right? So it's like, <laughs> because we have tons of deletion. I forget how much of the genome is different based on structural variants, but it's, I think, 10 times more than SNPs, right? Because because they're bigger, so it's, they're less frequent, right? So you don't have 10 million SNPs. You don't have 10 million structural variants. I forget the number. You, you have a few thousand structural variants, I think, typically between two individuals. But they affect large chunks of the genomes. In terms of total bases, it's quite the bit. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and then in the complex regions, there's even more rearrangement. So we're probably underestimating the actual number of rearrangements because in the complex regions full of repeats, we don't really know what's going on from the short read data. We need the longer reads to, to sort out. So we, we probably, these are probably underestimated. Looking in good regions, we already know that there's 10 times more bases affected by structural variants, small deletions, small duplications than. Okay.